Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Let me tell you, it is such an honor to be up here um, with these four awesome men that we get to hear from today. Uh, I promise you, no, not any one of us here are alike in not only our personalities, but even in our upbringing, but especially in our fatherhood. We're all at different places um, as a father, but what you will find in common is that each of us here, not only are dads living on purpose, but we're dads living for the cross that make room in our families, in our lives for the cross to fit. And that's the whole purpose of why we're talking about this is, is how the cross fits in fatherhood. And so today we get to hear from, from four individuals. And uh, without further ado, I, we want to get right into this. And we're going to start here with Chris. Chris Manigold right here. He is probably the newest dad, the fresh meat on this team here. <laughs> he is officially in diaper game. We've all hung our jerseys. Well, not you yet, man. You got, you got another. You're in a diaper game. You, haven't, you didn't make it clear for that one. <laughs> But we've rehung our jersey. We retired from the diaper game. No, but uh, he has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful 10-month-old baby, uh, Michelle. Oh, she is gorgeous. And uh, I know that this has been a thrilling ride for you as a new dad. Um, but I want to hear a little about you, a little bit from you, because going into this journey as being a first-time dad um, may not be what we think it is from the outside. Looking in, I mean, you see Chris with his daughter. He is focused. He's loving her. I mean, he has... She has all of his attention wrapped around her little finger. Uh, so you look at that and you would think, man, he must have wanted a, a kid since he was a kid. But it wasn't always like that, actually. There was different motives, different things. I want you to talk to us a little bit about that, Chris. Yeah, when uh, my wife, uh, Bernadette, you know, when we got married, uh, she was the one that really wanted a kid. And I was uh, very career focused. And I, I work in the entertainment industry, and, and it takes everything out of you and uh, that's all I wanted to do I was married to my career as well and uh, and unfortunately what when you see in scripture in Genesis 2 24 you see when God brings two people together he makes them into one but we weren't living that life mm. uh, we weren't living by Christ in terms of like what the marriage is supposed to look like and and the fruits that are supposed to come out of there we're kind of doing God but living our own separate lives mm. and uh, and that quaked our relationship our marriage to the nth degree because uh, we just we just we just didn't love each other the way Christ loved us and um, and so what I love about God is that he will intervene he will intervene um, especially for marriages and it's just for you to listen and um, one worship night uh, at another uh, church I was worshiping I got a vision of Bernadette crying and uh, when you see you know your wife cry or you see your mama cry you just pff, you listen and, uh, and I, I ran home afterwards, um, talked to her and said, hey, I saw you crying, babe, what's up? And she said, uh, I'm not sure if you love me anymore. And, uh, you know, do you want this to end? And I, you know, I was kind of taken aback about that. And uh, I had the option right there, you know, and I had, of course, the devil jumps in right at that time saying the grass is greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's too easy, you know, yeah. that's, that's too easy and God, just being quiet saying, you know, I know what you know, you know what you need to do. You know what you need to do. And of course, you know, I chose the hard route um, to be with my wife. And, uh, and it's funny because it, I think life and being with God after that moment was like a CrossFit challenge mm. program for me for years. And that like I had grown like muscles in the wrong areas. Mm. I had strength in so many of the wrong areas, but God's like, no, I'm gonna, we gotta reset. We wow, got to go into good, this man. area, you know, and yeah. uh, and what was great is, is that we did that for years. It wasn't like yesterday, the next day, everything was fine. Mm. We had to like walk together, you know, we had to, you know, take arms and, and walk together. He had to reteach me and, and, and just love on me and teach me about love. And um, and so what was so great is that uh, we kept pushing. We just learned about mm. balance in life. Good. You know, we learned about like and I, we talked about this earlier is like I, I love how with me with balance, I take the cross, right? You take the cross and the cross is the scale, right? And the cross needs to be upright at all times. So you gotta ask God, how do I balance this? Mm. And anything you do, work, you know, in, in life and how you love your wife. And that was my, my whole thing for years is like, love your wife, just love your wife. 
You're not loving your wife enough, Chris. You need to love your wife. Pull, get rid of all this stuff. Love your wife. And it's awesome because when I actually found that love of my wife, love of the love of my life back, um, my wife, every my, my 10 month popped up. You know, mm-hmm. and so you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, that uh, makes sense. It, it was, <laughs> and Put two, two together, <laughs> and it was awesome because I mean, through love of my wife, I was able to be a father, yeah. and even after that, and I see my my little Michelle, uh, she smiles so much. She smiles a lot all the time, but she smiles when I'm kissing her mom all the time. Mm. And so that says so much that fatherhood it ties into your wife so much. And, good, and uh, you know, through whatever ways you got to fight for your wife uh, because you're fighting for you. And I really do believe that Jesus loves you just like you need to love your wife. Mm. And so just if, if you know Jesus loves you a thousand percent, try to love your wife a thousand percent, you know, but you know Jesus loves you more than that. Um, and yeah. so our goal is That's just really to good. match Jesus's love um, for ourselves and yeah. for our wives. That's really good. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> you know, it's it's awesome because you, you you mentioned that this this brought intentionality about in your marriage first, um, and as you invested love into your marriage, you reaped a child who will always know love. That that baby will never know anything but loving parents. But because you first chose to be intentional. Um, but what's even greater is now that you invested in that, it shifted your focus as father in fatherhood to be very intentional. Even in terms of having your career do things that the inter- entertainment industry doesn't just do for anybody. I mean, you were so focused that they were accommodating you because of you wanting to be the best dad you can be. Yeah. And I, I say it's kind of jokingly, but after every show we do, I retire. <laughs> and uh, because, I mean, I don't know what God has next. And I'm not going to go back into something without my family being set. And my wife being happy, Michelle has that smile, and uh, whatever I have to do to make sure that the next show has my all, but I, I just don't want to mess up what God has already restored. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is my ministry, and so I'll take days off, I'll, whatever I need to do to make sure the first ministry, my second ministry in terms of Michelle and Bernadette are set, and then I work after yeah. that, whatever God has after that. Yeah, and togetherness is, is, is key, right? I mean. Together is where you found Elevate Church, made it your home. Um, then here comes Michelle, and now you're doing life together as a family. Um, I say I found uh, Elevate Church playing Pokemon Go. Yeah. So I just want to throw that out Come there for on. Pokemon Go. Yeah. With, with, my, with my wife. We were both, you know, trying to catch them all yeah. on the street. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and, and, and you know, I... Chris, just a personal, I, it's funny because I, um, I, we actually live like right down the street from each other. It's really cool. And I see him like going on these walks with his daughter. And it's the most precious thing because cause he, you see this man and, and his determination is to sow seeds of righteousness, of loyalty, of faithfulness to his daughter at such a young age that he would take her even on walks together. And, and he's not just like walking her just because like, uh, but he's like speaking to her, praying over her, singing to her, um, smiling with her. And he's showing her an example of the love of the, of the father. Um, and I know that that's, that's an awesome testimony because that wasn't always there at first, right? Your love was consumed by your career, but to see it now is, is man, it's so refreshing. And I have the honor of watching that and being encouraging me. Like, man, I got a three-year-old, six-year-old. I need to get back to that at times. You know, sometimes we stray away from that. And that's an important reminder. Uh, I know Steve over here. Steve, you've been through that route about 10 hundred times. Yeah. You, you have a, <laughs> he likes to joke that you have like an army of kids. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome because uh, you've done that. You've poured into them. If you look at Steve, if you know Steve's kids, if you've ever come across any one of his kids, uh, you talk to them and you're like, those kids are so mature spiritually. They're kids, right? Now, now don't go like, well, I thought you said they were mature. Well, no, they're kids. They, but, but they know who to run to in times of need. They know who to run to. They know who comes first. That's Jesus. They know uh, the word. They know the power of the word. They know the power of prayer. They, they know these things. And that was not easy. But it's awesome to look at that and say, wow, when you look at those kids, you look at Steve. The only thing that comes to mind is you wrote, you, you're raising some spiritually maturing 
kids. Like they're they're on the track to spiritual maturity at a, such a young age, and that's not so common, and it's definitely not easy. But what makes that even more powerful is is Steve. You know, you 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 weren't always that spiritually mature person yourself. I mean, even recently, uh, it's kind of been more of a recent thing in the last decade where you've really made a decision to do some changes. And so even your transformation alone is like mind boggling. You would never know that you were the dad today based on who you were 10 years ago. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I do have the most kids up here. <laughs> there's, there's, I, I did the math and there's 13 kids Total between. between all of us, but I, uh, I have half of those kids. But, um, <laughs> you know, I know. I don't want to look at my wife because every time I looked at her, she got pregnant. <laughs> so she's over there, so I'm going to be talking on this side right here. No, I'm just <laughs> but yes, <laughs> but you know, um, you know, I'm still raising, um, and it, you know, when we're talking about spiritual mature kids, but in reality, we're still being raised spiritual yeah, mat- matured. Yeah. You know, we haven't arrived, you know, and the moment that I think that I've arrived, I better check myself. Yeah. Um, because sure. just because, you know, I'm the father or, or my wife's the mother, you know, we, we lose it at some, you know, we, uh, we miss it. We miss it. I want to say more times than, than none, you know, but sometimes we have to come back. And that's the training that we have to give our mm-hmm. kids. You know, when, I, when we came back to church, you know, um, we grew up, I could say we grew up in the church, me and my wife, because, you know, she got saved when she was 14. Um, I followed her four years later, I got saved when I was 18. Um, and then we got married when I was 19 and or 20 and 19. You know, we were babies when we got married. So mm-hmm. we, we literally grew up, you know. Mm-hmm. We celebrated our 18th year anniversary uh, wow. last year, and she tells me, I've known you more than your mom's known you, you know, and I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you have, you know, but, you know, we grew up together, you know, we, we were raised in the church, um, and one of the things that we, we experienced in the church is we were told how to live, we were told what to do, we were told what to say, what not to say, what we should do, and we lived that way. We were okay with it because that's what we thought church was. Um, we were living the expectations of other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we weren't living God's expectation. We were living the expectation of our pastors, of our leaders, of our friends. Um, you know, and you know, growing up, it was hard because we always failed. So we hit a point where, you know, we started to have kids, um, and. You know, we had our kids. We were in ministry. We were doing all this at a young age, and we said we need to stop because we can't meet everybody's expectations. And we literally said we can do it without God, and we don't have to meet any expectations Mm -hmm. because we weren't trying to meet God's expectations. We were trying to meet people's expectations. And we walked away. We walked away from God. We left it all, Mm -hmm. everything. Um, I want to say in the sinful life, that was the best experience of my life. Mm -hmm. But in my spirit, it was killing me every day. Wow. Every single day. You know, fast forward 10 years later, we come to Elevate Church. We walk in through those doors. I'm, I'm a mess. I'm angry. Um, my ministry was hating people, so I was really good at that. <laughs> because if you were people, I hated you. I mean, I <laughs> hate it with a passion, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we walk in through those doors. You know, I'm angry. My wife, the first thing that she does is she starts to get ministered to. She's got her hands up in the air. She's crying. She's being ministered to. I'm sitting next to her, and I'm so mad. I'm like, how dare she get ministered to before me? I am so (laughs) mad. And this is an every Sunday thing. Wow. Every single Sunday. And every single Sunday, I get more um, I get more mad and more mad. And now I'm coming to church hungover. I'm coming to church drunk. I'm Mm. coming to church, but... I came to church because I didn't want to fight with my wife. I didn't want to wow. fight with her and say, I didn't want my kids to say, why does dad get to stay home and we get to come to church? Mm-hmm. And in that, you know, I, I had to have my transformation. Um, you know, I, I went to a camp and, and I broke down in front of everybody, a whole bunch of men. I, I cried with them and I said, this is what's going on. God met me there. Um, you know, I come back, I tell my wife, mm-hmm. I tell my kids, um, and then one of the things that God started to speak to me about was really like, it's time for you to stop telling your kids how to live. Wow. Don't tell your kids what to do. Don't tell your kids how to do it. It's time for you to train them up. Yeah. See, and that's what I was missing. I was missing that training. I didn't have that training. Um, you know, um, Proverbs 22 in the Amplified, it says, train up a child in the way he should go or she should go. 
teaching him to seek wisdom and will for his abilities and talents. Even when he is old, he will not depart from them. Mm. So I had to stop for a minute and say, how do I train? Mm. How do I train my kids to believe in their talents and their abilities? Because my kids are talented. My kids are, they have abilities beyond I have. Mm. But how do I train them to turn those abilities and those talents for God? That's good. As I started to do that, I started to see my kids grow. I saw my son, you know, Joey's sitting there. He's probably going <laughs> to smack me when I talk to him later. But, you know, he was he was seven years old when we were going through this. And my daughter was five. And then my other son was like one. And wow. we had one on the way. And, you know, it was like, man, <laughs> we were in that diaper game for a long time. <laughs> but, you know, I had to stop and I had to talk to my kids. And I had to ask for, for forgiveness for my kids and say, hey, I haven't been the dad that I'm supposed to be. I'm sorry. You know, I... I sucked as a dad. I'm sorry. I was a good provider. Mm. You know, I was a good, you know, anything you want to call, but I, providing spiritually, I was lacking. And in that, they were able to forgive me. And now when I see them, now they're growing. Mm. Now they're growing in God. Now I don't have an expectation of them in the sense of they don't have to live um, with this fear mm. of like, I'm going to let dad down because now they're living with an expectation of God. And they, they say, if I can meet God's expectation, then I'm not going to let mom and dad down. Mm-hmm. You know? You know, I, I love that you said that, Steve, that it's not about telling your kids what to do, but it's training them up. And, and the whole reason why you're, we're really training up our kids is for the purpose of them being able to run to God on their own, not through dad. Right. It's, it's not for them to trust God because they trust what dad says about God It's that they trust God because they hear what God says themselves. And I know even for me, I mean, and, and, and that's not an easy task to do. Um, if you've attempted to do it and you've stopped doing it, it's probably because it's a challenge. It takes effort. It takes willpower. It takes determination and wanting to see your kids trained up in a way where they can be so dependent on God themselves and not rely on you. And I know even personally um, with my six-year-old, uh, I remember starting off every Sunday, always ask, always asking, hey, so what did you learn in class today? And at first, you know, like three years old, it's like, I don't know. I don't know. And then it went from I don't know to God. And then it went from God to Jesus. And then it went from that to, well, uh, we, we talked about this verse. And I was like, okay, cool. So, so it was hard, but I kept at it. I kept out it. Now, I don't even have to ask her. We, we get uh, home or we get in the car, and she's already telling me, Dad, this was the power verse today. I memorized it. I memorized it backwards. Uh, she's talking about the stories. She even went as far as to ask her aunt to buy her a journal. She has a journal that she can take to class to write down her power verses. So that when she comes home, she can practice them for the following weekend. And I just thought that was that was awesome. But it's not easy. And, and you did it four times. And you're still four, doing it. Four times. And, I'm st- and I got to do it to myself. <laughs> you got to do it to you yourself. Know, but, you know, yeah. Yeah, and in that, even my even my youngest, uh, Sarah, she's six. No, eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you have all these kids, guys. You're just like, uh, uh, uh. You know, she's eight years old. <laughs> But, you know, even in that time, um, I'll never forget because this was one of the, this is where I was at. I remember when, when my wife, we were going through our, our, our mess, and she comes and tells me that she's pregnant. You know, she's like, I'm, I'm pregnant. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm pregnant again. And I was like, okay, so what are you going to do about it? You know, no, no, but it was like, it for me was, what are you going to do about it? Like, I don't want the baby. Like, and I, that had never, ever crossed my mind, ever. And I looked at her and I said, by the time I get home, I want, a, I want an answer because I don't want this baby. Because, I, A, I don't know if it's my baby, right? <laughs> I mean, and B, I just, I'm not ready for a baby anymore and I don't want it. And, you know, God works in, in crazy ways, right? She goes, she actually went, but she got ministered to. And she came and she told me, you know, this is what happened. And I said, okay, fine, we'll keep the baby, you know, um, whatever, you know, another baby, right? But in that time, God was really ministering to me. Um, and when my daughter was born, I had to ask her for forgiveness as wow. an infant. Wow. As an infant, I had to say, I'm sorry. And as an infant, I had to speak this word over her life. And today, she's eight years old. When she introduces herself to you, she'll say, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm my mom and my dad's restoration baby. You know, and it's, she Come on, she man. Says, you know, that is amazing, man. Says. And she's, wow. She's not afraid wow. to pray for you. She's not yeah. afraid to, 
to run to God. Wow. And we're training. We're training. It's a training ground. It is yeah. a training ground. Yeah, that takes it takes discipline. What you're what you are, you're your you're your kid's spiritual coach, right? You're you're not just telling them by words, but you're actually leading by example. And the apology paved your way to be able to lead by example, really. Um, you even mentioned before that that the older kids they don't even remember you before they knew you the older ones knew you before but they didn't they don't remember anything about you being alcoholic all the things you went through they don't remember that and that's the power of god's restoration um that's the power of the cross that's the purpose of the cross right it's to reconcile us to restore us and uh getting over to george over here you know george uh, he's one of our our youth leaders um and man what's awesome about this guy is is these youth they they honor him they love this man they they respect him they do that because they can trust his example in their life he's been a spiritual coach to not just his own kids but to many kids a lot of fatherless kids a lot of young it's mostly young men really young men you've been such a a mentor to them you've coached them you've been there for support you've pushed them when they didn't want to be pushed and you were able to see greatness in them um, and I know that that's not just something that you've done knowing God. That's that's who you've been, even from a kid. Um, you were sharing a little bit about that. Why don't you go ahead and, and share that a little bit? Um, first off, how's my hair? <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, you know, it, <laughs> real talk, I think I only serve on the youth ministry because I want to hang out with human beings my, my height. <laughs> All right, that was the second one. No more, no more. I'm done. No, but um, in reality... You know, it, it hasn't been till, till late that God has began to show me, like, I've called you to reach the fatherless. And um, with that calling, there's a cost to it. And hence, I have no hair. No, that was another joke. Never mind. Um, <laughs> no, but, you know, sometimes it's hard to reach these young men. Um, I've been cussed at. I've been almost physically attacked one time. And... I think what God had to show me was, again, what it is to actually reach these young people. Mm. And that's the cross in itself. You know, uh, Adam and Eve, God and Adam, there was a relationship there. But the minute that Adam sinned, there was that separation. Mm. And God said, okay, there's that separation. But even in the midst of that separation, I have a plan mm. to reconcile with my creation. And that's the cross. Mm. And so, you know, God has, has kind of showed me, but I think the more I am exposed to these, these young people, mm. these young men, he's showing me that a lot of these young people, they have daddy issues. And he showed me, okay, they have daddy issues, but you have daddy issues too. So I think before I, would, I, I could um, tend to their issues, God had to tend with my, to my own issues. So a little bit of backstory about me. I'm, I was born and raised in the church from a very young age. My, my father was almost like a pastor. And I remember being a young man and yearning for a personal, intimate relationship with the most influential male figure at that time, who was my father. Mm. But I didn't have it. And it was even some things that I, I came and I approached him. Hey, Pops, we got to talk, man. Hey, you know, you're a great provider. I know you work hard for this family but I need more from you. And for one reason or another, he wasn't able to make the adjustment. Mm. And so I began to build resentment, anger, hurt, pain. And I used that as um, something that drove me down a very ugly path. Um, one of the very first male figures that came into my life introduced me to addiction. And that ransacked my life, my youth for a lot of years. Mm. And not only that, but I think I used the resentment that I had towards my father mm. as an excuse to justify my lifestyle mm. at 15, 16 years old, you know, using drugs. Um, and then there came this one incident, and I had got incarcerated for something I didn't do. Mm. And I promise you, I didn't do it because I'm in church and I can't lie in church, right? <laughs> so I'm literally getting uh, arrested in front of my house. Mm. And I remember the cops getting out the car and saying, yep, that's the suspect. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, my goodness gracious, what are you talking about? And, you know, they, they gave me a charge, um, GTA, and, and uh, trying to evade arrest. My outfit, ready? I had chanclas with socks on, <laughs> sandals with socks. I don't see how anybody can run from the police with sandals <laughs> and socks. That ain't happening, dude. I know I'm fast, but I'm not that fast, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in jail. 
and first time in prison and only time in prison and I'm like I'm looking at everybody else like okay I'm not gonna get anybody mad upset or anything like that like I know I'm not that big I'm big and hard but you know not big in stature whatever and so no it's good bro leave um so I'm I'm uh using that phone, collect calling, my parents like crazy, did like 10, 15 calls, nobody picks up, yeah, like save me, please, right, and I get a visit from my mother and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, and they start telling me, did you do this, I'm like, no, dude, look, I got socks and sandals on, it's not (laughs) happening, right, and um, they start sharing with me, and they said, you know what, we know you've been calling the house, but your father refused to pick up. And not only did he refuse to pick up, but he's not letting anybody in the household pick up. He said, you got yourself here, you gotta deal with it, right? So at that moment, I had to make a choice. I had already had anger, I already had resentment towards him. And I said, okay, this could either be fuel to the fire or an opportunity for me to change and shift, shift things. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna let it go and I'm gonna forgive him. And I remember I'm in prison for, it wasn't a long time. Don't act like I did years or anything like that. No, it didn't happen like that. Um, You know, on my way home, I knew that God was already doing something in my heart. Because I'm literally on on, on my way home and I'm I'm not excited to see my mother. I'm not excited to see my sister or even my girlfriend at the time. I was most excited to see my father. Because I had learned to forgive. God had given me the strength and the ability to forgive. And all, all I wanted to do when I got in the house is like, yo, pops, bring it in. Let's hug it out. And God allowed me to go through that for a reason. Because I deal with a lot of young people that have these daddy issues. You know, there's a scripture, Exodus 20, verse 12 says, honor your father and mother. Hmm. It doesn't say honor them when they're right. And it doesn't say honor them when they're wrong. It just says honor them. That's right. And it's a biblical principle that God revealed to me in that moment. Mm. Was I perfect? Heck no, because I still had issues. Mm. But God began to transform my heart and prepare me for the season that I'm in now. You know, that I'm working with young people and uh, so much anger, you know, that these kids have. And and they use that anger as as fuel, as an excuse that I can tear my life up, that I I can not value my life, not only my life, but value the life of others. And it's, it's been a miracle, and, it, and it's been a blessing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that uh, you see yourself in a lot of these young men. Like, you see, uh, you even see the conditions that they're going through, similar to what you went through. Um, just like you kind of saw a little bit of yourself in your dad. What's awesome is that it's like kind of like God does that with us, right? I feel like the question that God asks is, can I see a little bit of myself in them today? Um, are they reflecting me? Um, I don't think you can even position yourself in a way that is like a mentor if you can't first position yourself to imitate Christ. Like, there's nothing your kids are going to learn from you or young men that you're mentoring are going to learn from you if you can't first position yourself to imitate Christ. So the cross became a big deal for you because that's what gave you the power to mentor. That's what gave you the power to be a father to the fatherless. That's what gave you the ability to do that because you imitated Christ and you used the cross to bring balance in every area of your life. Yeah, and you know, you grow up saying, oh, I'm never going to be like my father. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be like that. And as a father, I saw myself doing that. I saw myself making the same mistakes and, and you know, again, my father was somebody that was always at church, but when it came time for him to be home, he wasn't that father figure. Mm-hmm. My first ministry is not this, mm-hmm. st- this stage. It's not this microphone. My first ministry is my wife and then my children. And, you know, God had to show that to me and, and you know, thank God that I'm not repeating that same cycle because I know I have a strong relationship with my mm-hmm. kids. I know that that, that that chain, that curse has been broken. Mm-hmm. But it's funny because, you know, God gave me a revelation the other day. I, I had taken my son to the park. My son is a connector like me. Oh, my goodness, he's got a gift. There was a time where he couldn't even speak properly, but he was making connections with kids like wabba, 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 and kids are like, all right, let's play. <laughs> right? Real talk. That's the miracle of God. Um, so I could take him to a park, and I'll see him connect with kids. That's what God does. God connects with pe- I mean, people in general, right? He, he desires to, to be close, relationship, intimacy, right? 
So I'm watching my boy operate in his gift, and, and God begins to remind me of the scripture that he says, you know, you see the miracles that I do, but you'll do greater things. Mm-hmm. And that's how God looks at us. Yeah. Like, and, and it became so real to me because I'm looking at my son, and, and God looks at me like that. Like, yo, I see, how could I put it? Like, I have an influence with this generation. God has privileged me with that. Mm-hmm. But I look at my son and I say, mijo, you're going to do even greater things. That's awesome, man. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I have to say this, you know, uh, and he would never say this about himself, but George, uh, it, just to even clarify what he means, like his ministry is first with his wife, with his kids, and, and then he's also available here at the church. I mean, committed, loyal, so committed and so loyal that he actually, on Saturday, uh, they were taking their kids out to Disneyland uh, for your son's birthday, your older son's birthday, and he took them, drove back down here, and right after this, he's going to drive right back out to Anaheim to be with his family so that his son knows that it's, it's, it's not that it's one or the other, it's all. Everything matters. The cross matters. And when the cross matters, everything matters. Time with your family, time in the house of God, time developing your relationship with God, it all matters. And I think there's an idea, a false idea, that for whatever reason, balance means only this. Like, I need to spend extra time on this thing, extra time on on family, extra time. And then we exclude without knowing the cross we exclude and we don't allow the cross to fit anymore but what george has made a commitment to do which i admire is that he's made a commitment to work that much harder if it means that he has to work that much harder and go that much further in order for his family to know that they come first that that they're his priority they're his first ministry uh he's not going to retreat or pull back from his commitments even at the church at his house Uh, he's not going to pull back he's just going to work that much harder and that's that's what Jesus did. He committed himself. He did that much further. He didn't want to go to the cross. He chose to go to the cross because it meant our eternity. And, uh, and I love that about you because I think your kids are going to imitate that behavior even as they grow. Uh, you are going to be able to look at them, and they're going to do greater things because of the standard that you've set. And, I, and I'm bringing it over with that to Blair. Blair, you know, you're, you're, you're the football guy which I'll let you talk about. Uh, Blair is an ex-patriot. Uh, he's been in the NFL. <laughs> Dang. It's getting real. Hold up. Woo. Usher's locked the doors, man. It's about to get rowdy. I shouldn't have said that, Blair. Sorry, man. I'll, I'll walk with you after service. Don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy because uh, your kids, you have two boys. You have t- all teens right now, but two boys and a girl. And, uh, and man, there are some talented, talented kids. Um, but it's, it's awesome because their path isn't quite what you expected it or desired for it to be uh, like it did for your own. Like you're, you, had a, you had a path, and you wanted so bad uh, for your kids to follow that path. But it was a little bit different. Why don't you talk about that? It was a little bit different. And by the way, they get all their talent from their mother. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, being being a football guy growing up my whole life, it was it was a lot different than I had imagined it to be. Um, and some of these guys have talked about dying to yourself, and I, I mean, I'm no different. I had to die to myself. I had to I had to remove some of my selfish ambitions, some of my um, personal uh, ideas about being a father and being a football guy, in order to connect better with my kiddos. Um, for me, it meant going from uh, being a professional athlete to uh, spending all weekend at, at hip hop, you know, conventions and things of that nature. And so, <laughs> so that's not something I signed up for. Um, but I, I, over a period of time, God kind of, God definitely worked in my life to um, be that support system. But it wasn't easy. Um, I can remember, um, you know, think about this. So for you, for you ladies who spent um, time as a kid um, playing dress up with your dolls in your in your wedding outfit, right? So it's something that you had planned for a long time and I'm no different. I mean, football was an active part of my life. My dad was a professional athlete. I'm the youngest of three boys and um, so I grew up having, you know, just football, being, being mm-hmm. that type of guy. And um, something that struck me just recently you know, if you were here Wednesday night, um, Frank uh, made this comment. He talked about how um, lots of people can carry the cross, uh, yeah. but fewer people can die to it. Yeah. And I had to die to, 
to some of my selfish ways and some of the ideologies that I had for my kids because how many of you know with kids, maybe your interests aren't the same as what mm. their interests are. And so um, I had to do that. I had to, you know, it was easy for me to go around and, and, and uh, help people and, and work with people um, with the cross and, mm -hmm. and, and bring people to Jesus, but it was a whole different deal when I had to die to myself. And, and uh, I can remember praying specifically, um, you know, God, please show me the desires of my kids' hearts. Show me, mm -hmm. show me what that looks like. Show me, um, you know, what their passions are. And not only that, what their passions are, but um, that I would have a passion for that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, God just began to do a work in me, and um, it, it didn't take very long either. It was a fairly short period of time that, um, you know, once I prayed, a couple of weeks went by, and then I just, um, when I was at these conventions, when I was at mm. these uh, places, just began to love watching mm. them and supporting them and encouraging them. And um, But it, it, it wasn't easy. It took some transition. Yeah, it really did, and and obviously you look at his kids now, man. If, if you see any of his kids around here, Kason, Kale, Carly, um, they are a reflection of that hard work. Um, they they are the first. They are the first to jump in an opportunity to serve God. They are the first to jump in an opportunity to help their family. I mean, I've 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 been with you even at your home, and I've seen they they understand the concept of family um and there's an understanding there and what's interesting is that they carry that same personality even into the entertainment industry which they're both they're all in film they're all in in, in that industry um and you've had to take this the position of support but what's awesome is is you went from nfl and then you became a coach and now your passion is the very thing that's necessary to help coach your kids passions uh, they don't get the pat on the back job well done come on you get it next time in the industry they get a whole bunch of no's a whole bunch of you weren't the right fit a whole bunch of sorry it's not what we're looking for I mean they go through that constantly and they're kids they're teens and they're being told this constantly and it's awesome is that God would know their future that he would prepare you coach Blair coach dad to be able to be there to coach them through it and you mentioned that you've even had some strategies of your own to help them through that to support them yeah so I use Menchies as my strategy <laughs> um, how many of you know Menchies <laughs> solves a lot of problems with your kids yep. <laughs> so yeah. you know when my uh, individually, my kids know sometimes whenever um, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. And, and my wife, again, has done a great job because she uh, takes the boys out on dates and Carla and I go on dates from time to time. And um, we use Menchies as a tool to, they know whenever Menchies is coming, we've got some things to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, it's, but it's encouraging because it is a difficult industry. Um, wow. uh, you know, a lot of times I have to, you know, my wife is such a key part of that Be such an encouragement to her because she goes through what they go through. She's mm. the one that's with them all the time. Mm. But uh, there are certainly times when the coaching comes in. I think um, being a leader my whole life and being um, not only that person that um, got myself ready for whatever, a game or, or whatever, but getting those around me. And I think we do a mm. good job of that as a team with mm. our kiddos. Mm. Um, unity, unity is critical. Yeah. Um, yeah, not only in definitely. our marriage, you know, you hear these guys talk about how their relationship with their, with God comes first, then their relationship with their um, Twice, wives yeah. and how the kids see that. And God just does this amazing thing where he provides unity. And it's the times that we're not in unity that we, you know, there's dysfunction. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and, and to be upfront, I mean, this, this has been a brutal year for us. It really has. I mean, um, Things have gone well with us, I think, personally with our relationship with God. But selfishly, we, we packed up and we moved from Texas to come here and uh, for our kids to give them the opportunity to, to um, uh, spread their wings mm -hmm. and fly and, and, and do the things that God gave them the gifts and talents to do. And so it was a dry season. Um, you know, Kale in particular um, had five opportunities this year that um, – now think about this. So here's what this looks like: is the entire family, not just between he and mom, going over um, scripts. You know, so they get a, a ten-page script. You know, he's got 24 hours to learn it. He goes into an audition. 
does well enough where a couple days later he gets a call back. A week later he goes in for a um, um, producer session, makes it to the next round, and now it's between he and somebody else and uh, for a, a cold read or a testing. And after six weeks of everybody kind of putting um, everything into mm -hmm. this, uh, they, you know, we get the phone call that it goes to somebody else for whatever reason, um, and that's devastating. It's yeah. devastating to um, to mom and I, um, the brothers and sisters who have helped this whole six weeks with reading and memorizing script and putting their heart into it as well. Um, and and here's the thing about it is, um, we've got a great relationship with God, and I, I feel bad for those who. Mm. I know how tough it is now with a relationship with God, much less somebody who yeah. doesn't. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, we take it. Um, the kids are very resilient. Um, so all of these opportunities that he's had this year, even though it hasn't worked, uh, worked out for him, we know for a fact, we, we take a look um, behind us at all the times where we've taken that step of faith yeah. and where God has continued to open doors and when we look, we see all of these marker stones where God shows up with or without making the audition, That's with or good. without getting this role that we really wanted, That's good. but knowing for a fact that he's got something, he's got yeah. a purpose for them. That's good. And That's good. Um, I, I guess the last thing I wanted to share is, you know, um, how many of you know the story of Footprints? Um, it goes a long way because in those times where we, we can only do so much and, and we put everything... Uh, into all that we're doing, but you know, um, when you look at that, there's something to be gained from it. You have somebody who, who was doing the same things we were doing, day in and day out, uh, getting really frustrated because he was walking along with, there were two sets of footprints, and after a while they stopped. And the guy got really angry with God. And he, he said, he looked at Jesus and asked him, you know, during the most difficult times of my life, you stopped. There's only one set of footprints. I had to walk by myself. And Jesus looked at him. He said, hey, listen, it, it wasn't that I wasn't here. It was that I picked you up and I carried you to where you were. That's why you see the one set of footprints. Yeah. And so um, I just encourage you, especially fathers today, um, things are going to be very difficult. You're going to go through uh, life's challenges, things that, that, that come up every single day. And even in the most difficult times of your life, when you have that relationship with him, don't ever think that he won't pick you up and carry you Why? because when you can't do it on your own, that's right. he'll pick you up and he'll move to, right. to where he wants you to be. That's good, man. That's good, Blair. Thank you for that. Yeah, you know, uh, and I think that's the perfect segue for us to wrap this up, um, but I'll let Steve uh, kind of close this out because you were talking, you are sharing with us, Steve, um, just your, your this understanding that you learned from an upbringing in your own home with your dad now it wasn't your dad didn't raise you in the church you you that was a decision you made but you had a different upbringing in your home that wasn't a bad one um but it taught you some things it uh it, and you carried that relationship into your relationship with your kids and built this unity uh talk to us a little bit about that you know growing up i didn't i didn't think i had a really bad upbringing i think my parents were amazing um, but church wasn't in their in their spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, we only went to church every Christmas and Easter. You know, we grew up Catholic. Um, but then, you know, I like to make fun of everything, right? So if you guys know me, I'm a jokester. So my mom stopped taking me to church on Easter and Christmas because I would make fun of people in <laughs> church, you know? So church wasn't important, you know? But even growing up, I used to see, you know, in our, our apartment buildings with friends and, and even when we started going to the church, that the women always took the lead in the church. You know, the women were the ones leading the way, leading the God movement and, and leading these small groups and, mm. and prayer nights and, and all these things. Growing up, that's what I saw. So for me, even knowing God, getting married at a young age and, and understanding God, uh, but not being trained, I always saw church as a weakness. I always saw the cross, especially the cross, I saw it as a, as a weakness. Um, because it was like, I can't fix these things on my own, so then I'm weak. I can't change my situation. I, I'm, I'm a weak person. I'm a weak man. 
Um, and that's what turned me off from, from church. Even coming back to Elevate Church, um, I didn't want I didn't want people. I didn't want to expose myself to people. I didn't want people to see the real Steve, the broken Steve. Mm-hmm. I wanted them to see who I wanted them to see. And I wanted to fix the situation on my own. I'll never forget, um, I I paid, well, my wife paid, because she always volunteers me for these things, but <laughs> there was a, a week long, it was called School of Worship. Um, and it was a time where you go and you just, you're in front of, the, you're in the presence of God and all you do is just pray, pray in the spirit, sing, and I can't sing. And the whole way up there, it was a two hour drive. I'm driving up there and I'm crying. And I'm like, I don't want to come here. I'm carrying my cross the whole way up there, man. I'm just like, there's going to be all these holy rollers up there, Bible thumpers, and I'm just letting God have it, right? You know, and I'm just, I pull into the driveway. I'm sitting in my car for another 20 minutes, and I'm crying. And I look like I'm having this conversation with God like I'm a crazy person. Like, I, But it's because I'm, I'm just arguing with God because I don't want to go in there. So I said, I, I said, fine, I'll go in there. I went in there, and I was rocked. I come back home. My kids asked me how it was, and I said it was amazing. I said, hey, I learned how to speak in tongues, and I learned how to sing in the spirit. Let's do it. And they were like, okay. And we started doing that together. I mean, I'll never forget. It was maybe like three or four days later, my youngest son, Noah, we were just hanging out, and he's like, Dad, let's do that thing again. And I'm like, what thing? And he's like, let's pray in the spirit. And I was like, okay. And we started to pray in the spirit. And in that moment, I realized, I realized in that moment that the church is powerful that the cross is, is, is power. I had to get up, go to my closet, and bring out my cross and dust it off and put it in the center of my home, mm. make it its foundation. See, I had a picture of the cross of, for those who love to build stuff. I, my picture of the cross was this beautiful cross that was sanded, that was smooth, that was where Jesus laid and was like, ah, oh, yes, awesome. No, it was, it was ugly. It was horrible. It was heavy. Yeah. I had to carry it. Yeah. You know, he, he had to use all his might, all his will, all his power to walk and carry that cross. And today I can tell you, when I look at my kids, I see the power of the cross. When I see my kids worshiping God, bringing people into the presence of God and leading them back, them back to the cross, that's what makes me happy. I see that and I see, man, the cross is powerful. So for you guys, for you men today, maybe you woke up this morning and were like, fine, I'll go to church if you invite me. Fine. Maybe maybe you're you're at the place where I was. Maybe you see the cross as a weakness. Today, you'll be given that opportunity. It's the most powerful thing. The most powerful thing that you can allow to be the foundation of your house, to be the center of your house. It's the cross, like Chris said, that it's, it's going to hold up your house. Yeah. It's going to hold it up. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Can we give it, can we get up for these speakers today? I'm telling you, I learned from each, I learned from each and every one of you, definitely, especially after today. So I, I'm, I'm excited for, for what's next. Um, you know, if, if you're a dad here today, we want to celebrate you. Um, if you can go ahead and stand to your feet, dads, we want to, we have a special gift for you. And church, can we honor these men who are standing? Come on. Uh, I, I want to say this. I don't think I don't think we show enough honor to these men who have been created to be the front line of their family. We can give them a bigger hand and celebrate them. Because they deserve it. Listen, I, I, I'm pretty sure 99% of every man standing would not be the man who wants the attention, who wants the glory, wants the praise, they want their family to get that. They want their family to be taken care of. And so for men, I, I want to speak to you. Um, I'm going to even put my, my dad hat aside, and I want to talk to you even from the perspective of a son. Um, fatherhood is not easy. Fatherhood is not a, 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 a roadmap to success. Fatherhood is a choice. You all have been given the choice to be the dad that God already planned for you, that God already knew you would be. He knew the children you would be mentoring and coaching. You would be raising up other versions of you that would go on to do greater things. And just like Steve said, carrying that cross was not pretty. Carrying the cross, it was rugged. It was ripped. It was tattered. It had splinters. It dug into the back of Jesus, but he carried it because he saw something greater on the other side, and that was your freedom. I want to encourage you today, dads, that we would not quit when the cross starts to scratch us up a bit. 
when the cross starts to get heavy and we feel like throwing in the towel because you chose this fatherhood thing, because you chose to be in your kid's life, because you chose to be there. Maybe you're an awesome dad, but you, you've gotten so weighed down by the weight of the cross that you've just wanted to put the cross aside. I want to encourage you together, let's keep carrying this cross. This cross is, is what's meant to, to provide a, a way of freedom for your kids to have that maybe you didn't as a kid. Maybe growing up, you had a good relationship with your dad, but it wasn't, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't fulfilling. It didn't give you purpose. It didn't make you feel like you belonged, like you were loved. I'm here to tell you today that the cross reconciled your relationship with the Father, so you don't even have to worry about that void. It's been filled. God the Father himself is telling you know, how proud he is of you, his sons, that you would carry the, the badge of being a father, that you would imitate God the Father, and you would be the best dad you can be in, not, not in your strength, but in the strength of Jesus. So I want to pray for you quickly, and then they're going to hand out the gifts. But uh, church, would you stretch your hands out to all the dads around you? Just go ahead. If there's a dad, look around you. Stretch your hand out to them. Uh, we're going to pray for them right now. Steve, why don't you go ahead and, and pray for this dad? So, Father, we just come before you, Lord God, and we just lift up every single dad here today, yes, Lord Father. God. That, Father, no matter what their week, their year, or even up to this point has looked, Father, that today that you would touch each and every man, Lord God, that you would minister to them in each and every way that they need to be ministered today, Lord God. Father, they have done the best to their abilities, Lord God. Now it's time for them to trust in your abilities, Father God. Father, I just pray blessing over each and every man, Lord God, that as they go home today, Lord God, that they would, Father God, not feel that they missed it, Father God, but that they would feel that there is time for reconciliation with their children, Lord God. That they would go home and embrace their kids, Lord God. That they would go home and make a phone call to their kids if their kids are out of the home, Father God. That they would go home, Lord God, and that they would be ministered and embraced by you, Jesus. So today, Lord God, we bless each and every man, Lord God, each and every dad, Lord God. Father, that their, uh, their work and their labor hasn't gone unnoticed, Lord God. We thank you, Father God. Today, Father God, is the day that you have created for them, Father's Day. So today, man, we recognize you, and we thank you, and we honor you for the fathers that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.